Or you can't mute or you are on you're not muted <laughs> yeah, totally muted myself anyways thank you so much for coming this afternoon i see a couple people trickling in um i'm gonna wait a few minutes for everyone to arrive um in the meantime i will be releasing a poll for everyone to take part in Right, the poll should be launched. All right, let's take part in some small talk topics, everyone's favorite. How's the weather by everybody today? Eugene, let's start with you. Where are you at and how's the weather? Uh, today? Sunny Sonoma County, California, and it's been several very hot days here. And right, right now it's just like kind of mid 70s. Super nice. Awesome. And Jackie, where are you? How's the weather? Um, I am based in Boston and today it is currently 86 degrees and I just checked my phone and it says there's a flood watch. <laughs> We've oh. been cycling through rain and sun and rain. So we'll see. We'll see what happens by the end of the hour. <laughs> And Christina, we are currently in the same office, but how's the weather <laughs> next door? <laughs> weather next door is lovely. Uh, we had severe thunderstorms last night. So Jackie, maybe that's making its way up the coast for you. And now it's a severe heat watch. <laughs> Everything is severe. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we had for those to of you still trickling in there is a poll up in case um you would like to partake but yes the weather has been all sorts of crazy <laughs> yeah we had to shave my um uh, dog last night because you couldn't last beyond like 10 15 minutes outdoors on oh. walks <laughs> yeah wow. Eugene, oh, I, I, I want. I, I, I've never seen uh, your dog shaved. I, I must see a picture now. But <laughs> okay, I'll find one after and send it to you. <laughs> it's funny. My dog, whenever we go to the dog park, she just dives, dives, you know, into a tub with water because she's so, she's so hot. Yeah. Oh, Ellie, she likes water. Sunny yeah. uses to swim in any sort of pool, <laughs> even the little little safe pools that you can tell is <laughs> more than like ankle deep. <laughs> so, yeah, Jackie, do you have any pets that you have um, to shave <laughs> for the weather? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's one more thing to do. <laughs> I feel like Sonny's already so shaved. How is it possible to shave him more? <laughs> I know. He's just, uh, he basically loses his curl at that point, you know, because it's so short. Right. It's like a little <laughs> schnauzer. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will be getting started in just a minute. Um, for those of you who have not taken part in the poll, um, please do so. I will be closing that in just a few seconds here. And once again, my name is Jeanette Paul. I will be the host for today's webinar and I'll handle a variety of panel functions um, behind the scenes. So if you have any questions, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and throughout the webinar, I'll be tallying those up and um, listing them out for Eugene, Jackie, and Christina to answer towards the end. Alrighty, I am going to pull and getting a few more answers here. <laughs> All 
those last answers in. Okay. All right. Let's get started. All right. Thank you for coming again this afternoon, everyone. Um, today, you'll hear an exciting variety of um, facts that you'll learn today from an exciting panel of experts discussing on how artificial intelligence in its current state can augment the tasks that humans do and how it can affect the job industry, how we can foster a mindset that embraces this technology. So thank you again for coming. And now I will hand it over to our moderator, Christina Drum. Thank you, Isha. Uh, I'll introduce myself first and then I'll uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves. So hi everyone, my name is Christina. I'm the director of CX here at Loris and my background and passion is building and leading strong teams that help brands and clients get the most out of their software investments. So really honored to be here today and, and moderating the discussion between Eugene and Jackie. Eugene, would you introduce yourself first, please? Thank you, Christina. Uh, Eugene Mandel, I'm head of AI for Loris. Uh, I have been mostly interested in both professional and outside of work uh, for years with how humans and intelligence machine and, and, and intelligent machines work together to achieve different goals. And uh, this webinar is, uh, well, I think it's clear from the theme, from the topic, why, why it's very exciting for me. Amazing. And Jackie, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thanks, Christina. I'm Jackie Lane. I'm an assistant professor at Harvard Business School and also affiliated with the Digital Data and Design Institute at Harvard. Um, and uh, what am I interested in? In my research, I tend to work with companies to think about how we can generate and select um, novel and high impact innovations and more and more um, using AI to augment those processes. Sounds like you two are the perfect people for this discussion. Before we dive in, uh, let's go through the poll results because I, I think some of these answers could be surprising for some of our attendees. All right, so unfortunately, no one got the first answer right. It's actually all of the above. Duolingo did not get any love on this answer, but they have successfully applied ChatGPT. Um, for the second question, which of these companies have banned or restricted? Um, the answer is Apple out of this list. So this one was again, another dark horse. But they're not the only ones. There's other companies, well-known brands such as Samsung, Verizon, and many Wall Street banks have also restricted um, the usage of ChatGPT in their business practices. For our third question, how many employees were laid off of May due to AI? According to this report, it's actually 3,900 people. So most, most of our, our uh, respondents got this question right. And then which of the vectors or sectors were most impacted by these layoffs, it's actually the tech sector that was the primary, primarily impacted sector. So I think this is a great segue and framing for the discussion that we're about to have. So before we get too far down the rabbit hole, could you all help us get on the same page about what large language models are? Uh, I can take this one. So uh, it's interesting that I, it's been a topic for so many conversations for me that at some point I decided to just uh, summarize this and uh, write a post, which uh, I hope we can maybe uh, share the link to, which explains the uh, large language models and generative AI uh, as much as possible without jargon. Uh, I'll try to do it here even shorter, although this is exactly the case where saying something uh, succinctly is much more challenging than spending the next five hours on. Huh. So if traditional machine learning models uh, are trained to perform one particular task, and the task is usually expressing some kind of opinion about a thing. Is there a cat in this picture, true or false? Uh, is this sentence uh, happy or sad, okay? Then uh, large language models, they are very different. They are technically trained to do one task, but the task is given a piece of text to, pre, to kind of to generate 
what can come next? This is a very weird task. And uh, what we discovered that this task lends itself to the model being able to perform many things that it was not trained to do from very entertaining, like, you know, if you give it a prompt of uh, write me a, uh, a, a weather report in the style of Hemingway, well, it will actually do it. Uh, same applies to, of course, images and video. Uh, two very practical tasks as uh, predicting topics, extracting uh, sentiment and other things. Uh, so that's the two biggest um, differences from the traditional machine learning models, right? It's like what it's trained to do, generate as opposed to predict. Uh, and uh, instead of being a specialist, it's a generalist that can do all kinds of things with a lot of limitations that we probably will talk about. Awesome. I think that's a great segue um, and an introduction to make sure we're all talking with the same language. So with this new technology, would you say that all jobs are impacted equally or will be impacted equally? Uh, so well, it's, uh, I think it's Yogi Berra's quote that it's, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, with, with AI, uh, the milepost always has been moving, right? Every time we say, you know, like, well, here is a skill that's purely human, like chess. Oh, that's totally human. Boom. Uh, solved. Well, okay, maybe chess, but go, that's really only humans can do. And then, oops, it's solved, right? So um, I want to be very, very careful, right? But of course, when, it's, uh, when it comes to AI and um, to, gener to generative um, AI and LLMs in particular, you could, you, the principle is probably this. Uh, two kinds of two kinds of jobs. One job is uh, if you are creating images or text or video, you should definitely be aware of this because now you can think of, of generative models as being uh, drafters, assistants, um, things that solve the problem of um, blank slate. Uh, I hear it everywhere. Like, you know, so my, my, my sister-in-law is, is a designer. She literally participated in many, many kind of uh, professional, professional groups that of designers thinking through this thing. Uh, you have seen already people publishing entire children books and selling them on Amazon. Many other things. Okay, so that's one, creative. The second kind of jobs that can be affected is whenever you have to review a lot of information and make some kind of um, judgments, I kind of think about editing or labeling data in many, many kind of many aspects of it. This is something that generative models can do really well, which means that they will be encroaching on your job. Very important to understand is that uh, the way AI gets into your job can happen in at least in two ways. It's either augmentation or replacement. Uh, and we, we, will, we will expand on this, I think, in the kind of further part of the conversation, right? So, but for now it's kind of exp replacement and, or augmentation. Yeah, and I, I think, um, let me piggyback on what Eugene uh, just mentioned um, and take it into an angle from the workplace, let's say. Um, and, and similarly, you know, you can think of two different kinds of tasks, one of them being productivity driven versus being creativity led. And um, one of the aspects here is that we've seen, you know, there's emerging studies and, and evidence suggesting that there are huge productivity advantages of using generative AI, um, such as ChatGPT and, L and, other, um, and other kinds of LLMs, um, you know, for tasks like advertising campaigns or marketing campaigns, press releases, um, writing emails, all these kinds of things that are productivity driven. Um, you know, and it's very, very accessible and uh, relatively easy to do. Um, the other kind of task, which is more creativity driven, well, that's kind of this open question and open, um, and it's open to debate and perhaps like thinking about, um, the role of a manager. So, which many of our attendees could be as well. Um, 
one thing that I found that was really interesting recently is there is a McKinsey study that came out that said that middle managers spent probably one day a week doing administrative tasks. Um, and so they don't have this time to focus on team development, on coaching, um, if you are focusing on these administrative tasks or even creativity, which doesn't necessarily come like right when you want it to. And so here's an opportunity um, to probably to potentially augment what a middle manager does by saying, OK, all those days where you spend on admin tasks, let's use ChatGPT to help us accelerate that process so that you can spend more time on what you are fundamentally doing as a middle manager. Um, and so I think definitely there's two kinds of ways that we can think about it. For sure, um, ChatGPT is going to help us with productivity but it also enables to, uh, to us to free up our time to focus on those kinds of creativity tasks that are um, potentially uniquely human. Yeah, and I think creativity is such an interesting word here because people, myself included, will probably think immediately to your artists who paint with a paintbrush, but creativity could just be anything that involves and requires human discernment, such as, is this done effectively enough? Does this, does this meet a passing grade? And that's that objective versus subjective review. Would you agree, Jackie? Yeah, I mean, if you think about, you know, how do you create a competitive advantage? Um, firms need to innovate. And if you're, you know, if everyone from your leadership to um, your employees are focusing on um, task work that is not necessarily creativity or innovation led, then um, where does your competitive advantage come from? Uh, and so essentially, if we can figure out ways to incorporate these kinds of tools into our everyday tasks, then that leaves us more opportunities to focus on those creativity, um, innovation kinds of activities. That makes perfect sense. So Eugene, thinking about your experience in the tech sector over the last 20 plus years, how are you thinking about which jobs are most impacted? And does this remind you of any other um, any other technological advances that have that have happened in our in our lifetimes? So I think it's uh, I think it's great to be informed by past transformations, right? Because every time we say, well, generative AI or AI in general, it will change everything tomorrow, right? It's good to look back. Probably one of the biggest waves of change in technology over the past, well, at this point, like 20 years, right, was introduction of SaaS. And uh, like any technology, it went through this kind of, through, through this graph of, uh, you know, from an extreme excitement to, from, the, from extreme excitement to, to some disappointment and then to some kind of uh, steady state, right? We know that it took much longer to SaaS to really make an impact and even now, it's questionable if um, uh, all the productivity promises have been realized, right? Because with introduction of new technologies, it also introduces new, uh, <laughs> new problems of managing this technology. Uh, with generative AI and um, AI in general, I think we will follow the same trajectory but it's somewhat difficult to predict, right? Because some, you know, there is this you know, expression that we, we, we usually underestimate, uh, we, we overestimate the change in the next you know, year, but we underestimate the change in the next 10 years. Uh, that's, something to, that's something to inform us, yeah. Amazing. And then when you think about jobs that might be impacted, do you evaluate specifically from an AI product mindset, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about what motivates the task and all of that? Can you kind of walk us through your overall framework? Yeah, so uh, when thinking about where to integrate AI into a business process, uh, one of the most important and most difficult decisions is to decide which job is more suited for humans and which job suited more for machines. Uh, I can I can bring an example from uh, from well from something that is very kind of dear and near and dear to me, customer support, right? So obviously one of the biggest uh, influences impacts 
of AI and customer support have been self-service and uh, autoresponders chatbots. Um, okay, so we have to think what users, what customers want when they interact with the chatbot. Let's say, uh, do they know that they interact with the chatbot? Should they know? Does it create expectations? Yes, absolutely, right? Because for example, in customer support, uh, the agent has several jobs. One is just the functional, well, answer questions, troubleshoot, uh, guide you through it. But then there is another emotional job, right? Because usually when customers contact support, uh, well, they don't contact support just to talk usually, right? There is a problem. Uh, agents uh, employ empathy. They kind of, you know, handhold. They reassure, right? Do people expect empathy from chatbots? It's a question, right? So, for example, in customer support, one of the principles that we usually follow, right, is that if an issue is very emotionally loaded, you probably don't want a chatbot to handle it. You want a human to handle it. Moreover, imagine that somebody codes an amazing AI so that chatbot sounds more like a human and uh, is uh, like its empathetic um, responses are actually reasonable. If you know that you're talking to a chatbot, how will you treat it? Like, it's not obvious that even if the chatbot says all the right things and all the stories and all that I understand use at the right point, it's possible that it actually will um, evoke very negative response in you because you're hearing the words, but you know that, okay, like, you're not really sorry. You're not really feeling for me. You have, you have a bunch of beats. Right, so deciding, yeah. so deciding, uh, deciding uh, which job is uh, human and which job uh, is machine. This is something that managers, product managers, uh, people that create companies, create products, will have to meticulously decide case by case basis. And maybe just a point about the empathy. Um, so in healthcare, um, one of the interesting things there is that um, you know. Doctors are rating responses by um, by ChatGPT to be more empathetic and higher quality than actual healthcare work professionals. And so, just think about that for a moment, right? Like these are <laughs> higher quality and more empathetic, and people um, are like these responses. Of course, you know we don't know if there there is this aspect of deception that you mentioned, Eugene. And so, if people knew that these were coming from AI, how would they internalize that? And how, how would they feel? Um, those are open questions that we don't know about, but what it really suggests is that, you know, companies that don't think about this for their context, for their use case, for their customers, for their employees, um, everyone is in some ways impacted. And, um, and as you were saying, it really depends on the, on the case, but it, warrants consideration, right? Regardless of what sector or what role you're working in. And um, just to share an anecdote um, from another company, like, uh, you know, these are, these are one of those moments in time where you want to be, where it's really, really important to embrace this kind of technology. And so just sharing an anecdote from, um, uh, from a colleague of mine who worked with this Japanese company called Rakuten. And um, essentially they're a Japanese fintech company. Um, you know, a few years ago, they said, everybody needs in our company needs to learn English because it's going to be a strategic advantage. And so everybody in the, in the workforce or everybody in this company had to learn English. And after they accomplished that goal, they said, now we need to learn how to code. So everybody, regardless of how old they are, what level they were, had to learn how to code. And so it becomes this next question. So does Rakuten or does every company then say, does everybody, do, do we all need to learn how to use LLMs in our work or how, you know, how to put that into our workflow? Um, it feels like a moment like that where everybody will be impacted in one form or another. That's a really great example, especially because I personally use Rakuten and I love them. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting to hear that. Yeah, there's a yeah. success story. Um, 
And then I think the, as you were talking, the other thing that came to mind about chatbots, it's so interesting that this is the topic of our discussion because a chatbot can be deployed by the customer service team on behalf of a brand and a chatbot that deploys and shows quote unquote empathy in that scenario versus a chatbot that could be a, a, a privatization of a chatbot and form a relationship with another human. What does empathy quote unquote deployed from that relationship based chatbot look like? And Jackie, I think you mentioned uh, when we were talking last week, some, some studies that your team was doing around chatbot relationships and some preliminary findings there? Is there anything there that you would like? To oh, say? yes. Um, well, it, one of the things that we, we, um, that we started looking into was whether um, humans could detect differences between AI and or chatbot versus human responses. And um, these were all related to, they were all text responses, and they were all related to um, innovation related questions. Um, and what funny enough, they had a 50-50 chance of getting the, you know, the response right, because it could be either AI or it could be human generated. And people performed worse than by chance because they would come up with all these reasons for why um, some response would be human or AI generated. And they would say things like, oh, this must be human because it's so much more empathetic and, and it's relating and it's saying that they have all these qualities um, that make them uniquely human. But um, you could take that with a, you know, either that's scary or that's, you know, promising, but um, that response could be applied to the AI ones as well. And so it's no longer this human, unique human attribute to show empathy and to show emotion and to, and to carry trait because AI can adopt personas and AI can show empathy as well. And so increasingly we are blurring those lines and to the naked eye, um, humans that we re that we recruited into our sample to part participate in the study couldn't tell the difference. This this is so interesting because well the Turing test right basically AI being able to talk in a way that the, another human could not say if it's a robot right. I think lately what happened that AI didn't just pass Turing test it actually broke Turing test because now that AI can do it so well. Every time you see a piece of text, every time you participate in some chat, even when you're talking to a human, you actually start doubting the veracity of, uh, well, am I really talking to a human, right? It applies, by the way, the generative AI will apply to a lot of things. Every time you see a picture, every time you see an essay, every time you see a video, you will have to think, uh, was it really created by a human? Does it, does it reflect reality or is it something generated? Like the, the just the universe of things we will have to think about, it's mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely. If you think about it, empathy is really societal's rules for how we interact with one another, right? And that could be codified into an LLM to say, every time you see this, react and perform a task this way. You see someone who is really, expressing issues and frustration react with something that means empathy and do it in words. So yeah. it really feels like this is impacting, especially knowledge work a lot sooner than we might expect. So Eugene, I'm interested on your take on what industries or jobs could be feeling the brunt of this impact most, um, most quickly since Jackie gave us some great answers around the medical industry and that was super interesting. Uh, so again, I'll start from uh, what I know the best. Uh, so customer support, absolutely, right? There is a very long history of a technology being applied to customer support. Uh, well, obviously, because you want to uh, you, you want to cut costs while in, while increasing quality and uh, serving customers. Uh, so in customer support, there is one obvious area. Well, it's the frontline workers, right? Actually, agents talking to the customers, more and more of the frontline work will be taken over by the machine. Uh, I don't know, remember the choice between replacement and augmentation. To a degree, again, it might be some, some somewhat controversial statement, but I think when it comes to frontline workers and customer support, 
I suspect it's more replacing replacement than augmentation. It's much more self-service. It's much more chatbots. Um, but customer support is not only agents. There are QA managers, CX managers, analysts, uh, operations people that kind of stand on the behind the front line. Uh, their jobs will be very much affected because every time you uh, verify that something happened, every time you are looking for a particular trend, every time you're trying to optimize content or to write content, AI in general and generative AI will be part of your will be part of your workflow. So that's customer support. Then uh, kind of veering away from customer support, uh, it's. I've been really surprised how much influence uh, latest AI has on programming. Um, I know, like a lot of people that I know personally, use uh, all kind of you know, something like GitHub Copilot, which actually helps programmers to write and generate some code. I know people that use ChatGPT to actually generate code and then, um, well, and then edit it. It means that, so what does it mean? Augmentation replacement? I think augmentation. Augmentation in this case, and every time AI, every time technology is introduced, you're kind of thinking, well, does it replace jobs or does it create more jobs, right? Because on the one hand, you can say that, well, a given piece of uh, coding, uh, fewer programmers are needed to do it. But now programming can be applied to more tasks. So it's tough to say. Uh, same applies to data analysts, to, to, to data analysts, actually. It's amazing what uh, even ChatGPT with its uh, code interpreter extension can do in terms of automated uh, data analysis. Completely agree. So let's dive into more of the augmentation part instead of replacement, uh, because I do think that this is super promising and there's a lot of new jobs or responsibilities that could be unlocked with this technology. So again, looking back on our history and what we've learned uh, in the near in the recent past, what are some examples of successful collaborations between humans and machines that have actually resulted in significant advancements or breakthroughs that would not have been possible without that collaboration? Jackie, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, for sure. And um, I think Eugene really set us up nicely to discuss this, um, you know, especially with the with the technical work um, in things and tools like Code Interpreter or GitHub Copilot. Um, one area where we've been seeing this augmentation come through is um, the ability for and um, for people to design um, like here's an example, robotic arm designs. So um, for a while now, I've been collaborating with one of, one of my co-authors and I have been collaborating with NASA. And one of their challenges is to um, that they've um, that they've typically gone out to humans to do some human crowdsourcing is for these robotic arm designs. So over this past summer, we gave the task to two undergraduates um, to create under uh, to create these same robotic arm designs. Um, and they did this all through ChatGPT. ChatGPT um, told them the problem, the solution space to explore, and um, as well as uh, the code so that they, or to create the CAD designs. And so all they had to do was take the output from ChatGPT and then go to CAD and create these designs. And the wonderful thing about this is not just the simplification of it, but also the ability to explore different solutions. And so previously, um, you would imagine that you that each person would come up with one possible path or one possible design. But now you have a single individual who can come up with multiple designs. So if you scale that up further and you imagine that each of these individuals is coming up with multiple designs, all go exploring different parts of the solution space, then that is that in itself is a major breakthrough and also an efficiency gain at the same time. So. I love that, Eugene, anything to add on? Uh, uh, yes, couple of examples of very successful collaboration. So I would start with outside of professional. Um, I'm very interested in language learning in general and um, uh, what you can do with ChatGPT 
as your second lang second or third language uh, tutor, it's actually amazing. Uh, there is a whole community of language learners, right, where you can find a lot of blog posts, how you can give prompts for it to both test you, explain to you, be your kind of uh, conversational body. It's amazing. Uh, I would say that this, again, staying on language, uh, did you notice that uh, translation has been completely solved? I mean, this is amazing. And this is, of course, again, a use case of, gen of uh, generative AI, right? Uh, we got a quality that is incredible and think how many use cases it actually solves both professionally and outside of professional work. Uh, another, um, another use case is that whenever you, you need to understand large amounts of data, think about analyzing sales calls, analyzing support calls, same use cases, of course, in intelligence work, uh, being able to transcribe a lot of voice, analyze it for topics, analyze it for some kind of anomalies. This has been impossible before or it, well, well, prohibitively expensive. It is becoming possible exactly due to those technologies. And of course, you know, I have to say one more thing, a much darker one. So uh, anytime you see an essay uh, written by a student uh, for a particular home homework, well, you have to think, was this a successful collaboration between a human and a machine? <laughs> yes. Uh... That is an age-old <laughs> age <-old> student's <laughs> right, I think. <laughs> um, all right, so let's pivot a little bit and talk about how can we help our audience and individuals in, in the general public foster a mindset that enables them to use AI for their own empowerment and augmentation rather than seeing it as a threat or you know, uh, potentially being impacted by these technological advances. For sure. And so, you know, as an individual, the best way to get used to it is to try it out. Um, I think some of the hang up is about trying it. And once you try it, um, all of a sudden you realize there's this magical thing where um, the chatbot is really easy to use and you can get creative with it and you learn uh, and you adapt and you start to prompt engineer um, and all of that comes with practice. So I think the, the number one thing is not to be afraid of it and to potentially embrace. Um, start with something funny like writing a poem or um, you know, finding a recipe, something that's fun. And then um, eventually if it's useful, or if you feel like it, you can apply it to your day-to-day -day work. Um, and you know, the, there are um, aspects about this where there's questions about hallucinations. Um, the one thing is that this technology is only gonna get better from here on out. Um, OpenAI was the first, but now we have Llama 2 and it's open source. And if you look at that open source movement and what it's me meant for having things that are transparent and free and accessible to everyone, that's going to lead to innovations and improvements in technology, um, accelerated improvements. Um, and so today we're worried about these hallucinations given where the technology is today, but in the future, in a year or two, there's gonna be massive improvements. Um, and um, adoption. And, you know, similarly, it, it's a question of who is going to adopt and who's not. I mean, at, the, at this time, we're seeing much more adoption among people who have at least undergraduate degrees. And, um, you know, I, there was a, a recent study that said that 60% of people have heard about um, ChatGPT, but only about 15% have used it. Um, and so it's important if we think of from a societal perspective, if it does lead to advantages, use of ChatGPT, then we would want to have, um, you know, even students try it out, um, you know, workers from early, from entry level all the way to managers, because the, the way they're going to use ChatGPT, the way that we use it is going to be dependent on our own use case. And so, and, and similarly, from a tops down level, this is an opportunity for leaders to really think about how to transform your company so that you, it, you can bring in this kind of infrastructure and this technology into your workflows as well. That makes perfect sense. I think 
what I heard from that is everyone really has the freedom to become a scientist in their own right, run a little mini experiment of, hey, I identify there's this problem. I have a hypothesis that I could maybe use technology to help me test it at faster speeds and then see if it works out. Does it make me faster? Does it make me better? Did it help me think of something new? How can I edit the results and continue to iterate upon that? Totally. Yeah. Uh, Eugene, super interested in your perspective too, especially from a manager's perspective and someone who is leading our AI team here at Loris. So this is super interesting, right? Because like I totally agree with uh, Jackie's point that as an individual, the best thing to, uh, the best way to learn this is kind of by playing. As a manager, it's a bit different, right? Because on one hand, you have less freedom and more responsibility because you can't just like if you're responsible for you know for a particular organization you can just let's just play but you know we have private data and we can you know screw up an entire like business no right uh however i would still start with one thing uh to stay relevant as a manager as a leader one thing that you cannot afford to do is simply to ignore this change and pretend like it's ah uh, you know it's just another fancy thing that probably will not pay off in this i'm sure it is a change that is real it's not going away and it, it's happening uh which means that a you have to educate yourself now if you are a um, subject matter expert but you are not an ai person how do you educate yourself you have to find credible sources and the credible sources should be for your industry because there is no such thing for now as general ai it's always applying AI to your industry. So find uh, credible sources, educate yourself. Then when you uh, then analyze your business, you have to think about the goals, where the inefficiencies are, how AI can be applied to your particular business. And then uh, most likely you will not be able to just solve it yourself. It is about finding, well, vendors actually, right because creating products for business that integrate ai is a very it's it's a challenge it's very important to meet your team members users of those products where they are user interface um being clear is very important there and of course as you know well we actually create products like that right so I, I, like i understand the the issues there you have to worry about security. You have to worry about safety because, again, unlike as unlike a private person, you can't just play. That makes sense with more responsibility, <laughs> or is it with more power it comes more responsibility? <laughs> I think it's the other way around now <laughs> with AI. <laughs> uh, so, with that, that brings us to the end of our planned discussion points. And I'll hand it back over to Isha to review our Q&A questions and kick us off for that portion of the discussion. Thank you, Christina. And I wanted to once again thank the panel again for partaking in this discussion. Eugene, Jackie, Christina, this was fantastic. I learned so much already. And um, we actually did get a couple questions. And I think this is a really good question that I think it's, it's, it's a fun question to start off with. Um, kind of rapid fire, I guess. There appears to be a lot of discussion about AI and what it can achieve as it evolves. So what do you believe are the top three AI misconceptions and why? I think one of them is that, you know, today, we've talked a lot today about um, human and AI collaboration, augmentation, replacement. Um, the one misconception possibly is that AI is human. So there's humans and there's AI, but we're not the same. Um, and uh, AI recognizes and, and searches for patterns and it makes decisions. But, and there's something about us being uniquely human that is different from that. Um, and so it is a collaboration, whether in some cases it could be replacement or human replacement or AI replacement or augmentation, but we're, we're not the same. Um, so I'd say that that's one possible misconception. And I'll uh, hand think, it to Eugene oh, to come up with another one. So, so mine is actually, I still am struggling to define if it's the same, but said differently or a distinct um, misconception. It's the language we use when we talk about AI. You notice that in a lot of cases, we use language that very much is human. Like the model thinks that, 
the model knows that. The model hallucinates something, right? And uh, or even when we talk about, uh, well, it's the neural net. A neural net, and, and then you know, if you try to explain what, what neural net is, what you know, it's like it's kind of what we have in our brain. None of this is actually true. It's those um nice analogies that make it easier for us to talk. But I think, yeah, actually, as I'm talking, I'm thinking that I'm thinking that it's very close to Jackie to what to kind of to what you said. It's AI is not human, it's not it doesn't work exactly uh the way our brain works. Asterisk. We still don't know exactly how our brain works. <laughs> so would you, would you say that we can't know for sure if open AI is getting, chat GBT specifically is getting smarter or dumber? Or do you think that that is a misconception in and of itself? So uh, that, go for it. Yeah, no, so sorry, go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, that there's, it may be a misconception. Um, there's, so it's like, it's generative. And so every output that comes out is not a static uh, deterministic um, output. And um, that misconception is based on a paper where um, if he, it's as much about what is in the results as what is omitted. And so it's not necessarily clear whether uh, GPT-4 is getting dumber or not, but my sense is that we need to do more research or we need to do more experimentation to really understand the output. Um, Eugene, go for it. Uh, I, I, I'm just so sorry, I was just looking at the q and I see a new question coming through, right? Can we address it? <laughs> yes, we can jump to the next question. I think Jackie answered the first one well. <laughs> yeah, I think we will. Uh, so I see this question in Q&A, what's the best way to train an LLM for customer service application? Uh, I, I just, I can't like, you know, because that's what I do most of my day. I can't contain myself, right? So, <laughs> so um, in customer support, right? You really have two jobs. Well, many jobs, but relevant, relevant to this, right? Uh, you have to be a good conversationalist empathetic managing a conversation and then you have to be correct that helps uh, so something like chat gpt can actually do the first part really well you you could say that you know if you want some empathy kind of you know good thank yous good highs just good tone you don't have to train something like chat gpt specifically for customer support however when it comes to the second part that is very different Right, because ChatGPT has no idea how to change password in your application. It does. It has no idea what's the refund policy in your e-commerce store. So, you can't use one of the big providers' uh, systems or models out of the box. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do it. Either if you have your own data science team, you can fine tune, which is kind of pre-trained an existing model with your data that requires data scientists. Even more expensive, you can of course develop your own uh, large language model, but that's, I'm kind of not even saying seriously because for now, full training is, uh, is millions of dollars, right? Uh, and then there is a really interesting um, methodology where you combine an existing, open, an existing model like OpenAI, you index your own content repository, and then you create an application that kind of is between search and incorporating search results in prompts that go to uh, something like OpenAI or Anthropic. For this, you either need to use a product or you need to, or you need an engineering team that is aware of um, how to do that. Totally agree. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to wrap up from, from here. Um, another fun one, um, not exactly fun if this were to actually happen, but um, if Eugene and Jackie lost your jobs, if you both had lost your jobs today to AI, what would you spend your time doing next? Become a digital artist. Embrace mid journey and Delhi and, uh, you know, take the gamble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
It'd so, be kind of fun. Awesome. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> Taking your own advice, Jackie, I see. <laughs> um, apart, apart from running a bakery, of course, uh, that I would love to do. Uh, well, you know, I love what I do now, but, you know, if I really displaced me from my job, bakery is the next thing. You know how sometimes, uh, you know, there was this expression, people being um, gentlemen farmers, you know, people that used to farm, but they did it for, you know, for fun, not really because they had to. I would still uh, deal with AI and machine learning, but I would become a gentleman AI practitioner while running a bakery. Mm -hmm. I love that, that leaning into the things that are uniquely human. Uh, I don't think AI, at least large language models with dealing with text can replace bakers anytime soon. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that is a good one to end on, I think. Um, thank you all again, Christina, Eugene, Jackie, for joining today and answering these questions and giving us some, some real insights on um, AI today. And uh, I would like to thank all the attendees as well. Thank you so much for joining this afternoon. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of your e uh, afternoon and take care. And any further Q&A questions can be sent to my email, isha at agorist.ai, should also be in the first attendee link. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you.